Hello, my name is Kira Farrell. I'm the Kennel Club Library and Collections Manager and today we're at the Kennel Club Library. The library has been here since 1985, but a lot of the books and things we have in the library are much older than that. The Kennel Club itself was founded in 1873, but lots of the things we have in the library are older than that again. The library is based at our London headquarters here at Clarges Street in Mayfair. It's a huge collection. It's the largest collection solely devoted to dogs that's open to the public in the world. We have approximately 10,000 books and in addition to books we've got everything to do with the Kennel Club's history. So we have all the Kennel Club stud books, we have all the Kennel Club breed record supplements that records the names of all the dogs registered with the Kennel Club over the years. We hold championship show catalogues, everything to do with field trials, everything to do with the history and the heritage of dogs. So the Kennel Club Library is open to the public. Anybody can come and use it. Just make an appointment with us and you're welcome to come and use the library. We also do research on behalf of people because this is such a rare and unusual collection and there's so few collections like this in the world. We get inquiries from all over the world by email as well. So we do research and you're welcome to visit in person. The types of people who use the library, well, anybody can use the library. The types of queries we typically get are people doing research into their own dogs. These are people who own pedigree dogs who want to know more about their dog's own family background. We also hear from people who want to know about the human side of dogs. They may often have something connected with a relative, for example, a dog show medal or a catalogue or a photograph from years ago and they want to know more about their aunt or their grandmother or their grandfather's life in dogs and that's where we can help look up records to see what their involvement was as breeders or showers. We also have contact with students and universities. Anybody who has an interest in dogs is welcome to use what we have but where students come into it is often they are doing projects on the history of specific breeds. They may want to know about dogs in society. They may want to know about things like the evolution of the pet food market and the market for commercial products for dogs. We cover a huge range of subjects. If it's about dogs, we want to have it in our collection. So we turn up all sorts of unexpected information for people. We had a query a couple of years ago where a gentleman was tracing his family history and had some details of a grandfather who had been involved in dog shows. And from looking at the records we had, including his address and where he showed his dogs, we found out that he was actually a bigamist. This wasn't a surprise to his family. They did know there was something shady about his past. It's a strange place to find this sort of information, but that's what you can find in a dog show catalogue. That's just one example of a funny human story that we've come across here at the library. We've also worked with institutions. One in particular is the Wellcome Institution for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine at Manchester University. They are doing some major studies into the history of the dog in society, particularly in the Victorian and Edwardian period. They mounted an exhibition a couple of years ago at Manchester Museum, which we helped them with, and they'll be publishing an academic book next year based on the research that they've done here. One of the things they were particularly interested in was the history of the bloodhound. We have some great information on a really important bloodhound breeder called Edwin Brough, who popularised the bloodhound in the Victorian period. He kept some amazing scrapbooks detailing everything to do with his own dogs, and that includes lots of information about the Jack the Ripper murders. At that time, he took his bloodhounds up to Regent's Park in London and demonstrated their amazing scenting capabilities and the work he did with that was published in all the popular newspapers at the time. That's the sort of information that's in his scrapbooks and inspired lots of detective novelists and people like Arthur Conan Doyle when he was writing his Sherlock Holmes stories into the popular belief that these dogs have almost supernatural powers of scenting. So this is the very oldest book in the collection here at the Kennel Club. It's called Manwood's Laws of the Forest and it dates from 1598. So this book is a late Tudor book. Elizabeth I is still on the throne at the time that this book was written. Shakespeare in London is writing his plays. And one of the things he writes about a lot is the forest, the countryside. Now the forest is not just about trees, it's about any unenclosed ground that is for hunting. So it actually takes up most of the country. The remnants of those forests today would be in the Forest of Dean and the New Forest. So when Manwood came to write this book, he compiled all the different laws pertaining to the countryside and countryside management. And it's got a chapter on dogs in it. So that's the bit we're interested in. So 
for us it's interesting to see what the social status of dogs was at that time, who was allowed to have what particular breed of dog and what they were allowed to do with those dogs. So if we look inside, we need to find the chapter on dogs, which is this one here, of the keeping dogs within the forest. And what this tells us here is that with very particular laws about dogs and who can have particular types of dogs, the chapter heading is keeping dogs within the forest, who may keep dogs, what dogs may be kept, what dogs may not be kept, everything to do with the handling of the dogs and what punishments there were for having the wrong type of dog. What you have here is a situation where only aristocrats are allowed to hunt deer, so only aristocrats are allowed to own greyhounds, which are the precursors of any modern greyhound, deerhound, long dog, lurcher or spaniels. Those are confined to the aristocracy only. So this book gives us an insight into the working life of dogs and their social status in Britain. A book like this is obviously not something that the public can handle themselves, so we do have a modern facsimile copy of this book for any scholar who needs to use it. This one here is very important to the history of the Kennel Club because this is our very first stud book. It dates from 1874, the year after the Kennel Club was founded, but it gives us dog show results from the very first modern dog show which took place in 1859 and it takes in those first 15 years of dog showing before the Kennel Club was founded. So it gives us an idea of why the sport of dog showing became popular, who was involved with it, and why it became something that was such a, a landmark of Victorian society. These are the results of the very first modern dog show held in Newcastle in 1859. So you can see there are only two breeds involved, pointers and setters. The pointer judge owned the prize winning setter and the setter judge owned the prize winning pointer. Now that sounds a little bit dodgy, but really we're talking about a very small world at that time. There was a limited number of dogs at this show, limited number of breeds, but over the following 15 years, as we can see from looking through this, all the shows that you know now begin to happen. We've got Manchester, we've got Birmingham, we've got Leeds, we've got the beginning of showing in London. So this is the beginning of dog showing in the UK. It's the beginning of the Kennel Club's own history as well. This item here is very important because it is the first all breed Crufts catalogue. Crufts began with Charles Cruft holding some terrier shows. So this is why this says the seventh great dog show instead of the first great dog show, but this is the first all breeds Crufts. So this is a really, really interesting thing. Charles Cruft owned and managed Crufts personally from the foundation right the way up to the late 1930s when it was taken over and run by the Kennel Club. So as you can see it took place in the Agricultural Hall. That venue still exists. It's now called the Business Design Centre and it's on Upper Street in Islington in London. Now at this first All Breeds Crufts there was a very important exhibitor. If we look at the list of exhibitors in the back we see that the very first one listed is Her Majesty the Queen. So this is Queen Victoria and she and the Prince of Wales are both listed first in this catalogue as exhibitors at Crufts. And what's great about this and any dog show catalogue is that it gives the names and addresses of all the exhibitors so you can see the social background of the people who are involved in it and you can see that this great Victorian pastime of showing at the dog shows was something that spanned the social classes from the very, very top of the social tree with the Queen and the Prince of Wales right down to people who live in really quite humble addresses. You've got ease of travel, you've got people having more time off work, so it's easy for people to be involved in this new fashionable hobby, dog showing. And Crufts, at this point, Charles Cruft made a point of telling all the journalists that it was the biggest dog show in the world. It wasn't, but they printed what they were told, and obviously today it is the biggest dog show in the world. So this is an amazing little book. It looks tiny, but it's so interesting. It says list of dogs, 1846 on the cover, and it's got a crown. This is because Her Majesty the Queen, who is Queen Victoria, this is a list of her own personal pet dogs. She has 28 different breeds of dog, and she has several examples of some of those breeds. So really, she's got ooh, possibly almost 100 pet dogs, and these are pets, not working dogs and these are at Windsor Castle and some at Buckingham Palace. So she is a, a young woman at this time, she is in her late twenties, she's got lots of small children and she's got lots of small dogs so it must be fairly chaotic but it gives you an idea of how dog breeding 
and trading dogs became an aristocratic hobby that spread to the whole country. So she's got lots of breeds that you would expect her to have, the usual greyhounds and things like that. She's got lots of dachshunds and quite a few different German breeds and that will be Prince Albert's influence. She's got Russian greyhounds which are Borzois, a very aristocratic and popular breed at the time. And she's got some really, really quite unusual dogs as well. You see some old breed names in here. She's got things like Bedouin dogs and Persian greyhounds. They'd be what we call Salukis and Slugis today. We've got these ones, Chinese dogs. These are very interesting and exotic because these are Chow Chows. We know these are Chow Chows. And you can see that they were the gift of a Colonel Malcolm. One of them, Betty, has had pups. And these pups have gone on to more aristocratic people, Lady Portman, the Duchess of Kent, and to the Duke of Saxe-Coburg. So this one, Ching Ching, went to modern day Germany. So it's something you see a lot in this book, aristocratic people swapping dogs, giving each other pups as gifts, not just in Britain, but right across Europe. She's got some quite unexpected dogs. This one here, a small Cuba called Chico. That's probably a Havanese. Um, she's got ones that have come from very strange places. This one is just called an African dog. We don't know what this dog is, but it was probably brought back from an expedition to Africa. And this one, an Eskimo dog with the old French spelling of Eskimo. So this would be one of the first sled dogs. And again, this has come back from somebody called Captain Weems and is very likely to have been brought back from an exploration expedition. So if you have any questions at all about dogs, no matter how obscure, we do everything from PhDs to pub quizzes, you're very welcome to contact us through our website, which is www.thekennelclub.org.uk forward slash library.